Welcome to my narrated step-by-step -step tutorial for my painting, Fall Lake. The photograph on the right was my main reference for this painting. I actually took a series of photographs of the subject and used another photo for reference in addition to the one in this screen. I'll show that in a minute, but I'll explain why. One of the elements in this photograph that I'm showing now that I wanted to include in my composition was a distant tree line. However, I didn't like the way the tree gets cut off at the bottom. So I used another photograph I had taken which shows an expanded view of this tree and incorporated part of that view into my composition. You can see in this photograph there's no tree line at the top. However, I have an expanded view of the base of the tree. Before I even began my painting, I did a series of thumbnail sketches using the series of photographs that I had taken from my recent trip to this lake area to capture some of the fall colors. These are just simple quick sketches that are done with an ink pen and then uh, I come in with some watercolor and just put some color notes. Ideally you can do some of these thumbnails to capture the color of the mood, the light, uh, on location at the same time that you're taking your photographs. Then you can take these and your photographs back to your studio to compose your painting. Here I started to do a light sketch of my composition. I'm working on an 11 by 15 sheet of 140 pound cold press Lanaquero watercolor paper. So I'm working on one quarter sheet of a full sheet of watercolor paper. I'm using a B pencil to lightly sketch the major shapes of my composition. I'm also adding to it some of the elements that I, I think are important to show features such as spatial relationships, direction, and other important elements to the composition. Here you can see that so far I've drawn the major shapes of the tree and started to find the area that makes up the ground cover in the foreground. Here I'm giving an indication of where that tree line starts, where the shoreline meets the water. And one of the things I see right now is that line is coming right across and it's going to intersect where that branch hits that tree. And that creates a tangent. So to avoid that, I'm going to bring the intersection of the branch and the tree down so that it doesn't create a tangent with that uh, line of the shore. I could have also changed the, the, the line of the shore, but I'd rather just move the branch down on the tree. To avoid that unwanted tangent. And here you see just the simple sketch that I'm going to begin my painting with. If you look at this photograph you'll see there's a lot of textural qualities and I have no intention of trying to paint every branch, stick, and leaf that's in the photograph. So uh, my efforts will be directed at trying to suggest those textures. There are a number of ways you can do that, and if you've seen some of my videos, you'll see that one of the techniques that I, I like to use to create some of these textures is using some uh, liquid masking fluid uh, applied with a, with a splattering technique to help create some of those textures. I begin by using a toothbrush that I've uh, put some soapy water on before I, I start to squeeze some masking fluid onto it, and that'll help clean it up later. And you can see that I use a squeeze bottle that I have filled with uh, masking fluid. Uh, I've used a large jar of masking fluid and fill some little plastic bottles of different varieties that I use for different ways of, of, of applying the masking fluid. But this bottle has a wide opening and I can squeeze uh, the masking fluid right into the toothbrush. Sometimes I dip it right into a large jar, but either way will work. And I hit my uh, toothbrush against my my hand and it creates larger splatter marks and when I just take my finger and pull back on the bristles and let it go it gives a finer uh, splatter mark so I use the combination of those two techniques when I'm applying it in this manner. One of the things I'll do is I have this rubber tipped shaper and I'll take some of those larger beads and I'll move the masking fluid around a little bit so it doesn't look so much like a, just a big dot. Um, it takes a, a more organic shape.
The other thing I like to do in addition to the splatter is I'll take a fine line uh, masking fluid pen or in, in the case that I'm going to use right now is I'll take a, a squeeze bottle that I've filled with masking fluid and I'll make some linear marks uh, amongst these uh, spl the, the splattering marks that I've already created. So this is a bottle that I filled myself from a large jar of masking fluid I have. It's a, it's a bottle that's used for quilling to hold glue, but it works pretty well for a fine line uh, masking fluid pen, and they're very inexpensive. So if it does get clogged, uh, it, it's far less expensive to replace than the, the prepackaged fine line marking pen, so, uh, which I do use too. So here I'm just giving the indication of, some, of a grassy feel and some sticks and some twigs sticking out. And after I apply my wash, uh, later on, and I'll lift this off and it'll leave that fine line. The one thing about this is it does have this rubber cap that's got a lanyard on it and does get in the way sometimes. If you have an interest in using a bottle like this, I have uh, these listed on the uh, studio page of my website where I list all my supplies. So if you go to rservicesart.com, you can find these bottles along with the other masking fluid uh, supplies that I use. I'm going to begin by uh, applying a wash to the uh, area that makes up the lake. And uh, I'm, I've turned my, my board upside down. And so I'm starting to apply this wash with a one inch flat brush. This is one of the silver black velvet one inch flat brushes that I like to use. And uh, I have it, uh, the, the wash that I'm applying right along the edge of the shoreline. And I'm letting that uh, flow down away from the shoreline. And uh, again, I work on a an incline of about 15 to 20 degrees. So. My board with a quarter sheet is normally lifted somewhere between two and three inches on the back side to, to uh, allow me to work at that angle. The actual wash is uh, cerulean blue. It's a mixture of water and cer cerulean blue on my palette. And I've mixed it to a light mineral value. And I'm adding more water as I go down the page so that it gradates to a lighter value. And I want to take that wash down to uh, the shoreline and I've actually gone over the shoreline with those brush strokes where I really didn't want that because I want the pure white of the paper reflecting back through some of the fall colors that I have there so I'm just going to blot it up with a Kleenex and you can see those beads on the right now I can just take them down the page I, I didn't have to worry about those running down and the fact that they were there helped to prevent it from creating an edge while uh, I was working in other area of my painting and I want this to be a little darker towards the shoreline, so I'm putting a little richer mixture in there. And uh, I've actually added a little bit of peacock blue, which is a fairly uh, powerful blue tone. And uh, I want that to have a little bit more gradation from dark to light going away from the shoreline. So uh, I've put this darker tone in here, and I'm working wet and wet. So nothing set an edge yet. There's no backwashes. Uh, and I actually want to soften some of that transition uh, in some different places. So to do that, I'm going to use this fine mist spray. And you can see that I get fairly close to my paper when I do this. And I actually kind of pull away as I, I trigger the spray. And I'm blotting a little bit with tissue. Uh, this is given the reflection of clouds, so I want to give the, the feeling of clouds in this wash that I've put down. So I've gradated it from a darker tone to a lighter tone going down, but I've also uh, blotted out some areas, sprayed out some areas to get some softening and some lighter areas throughout uh, the areas closer to the shore to represent clouds. And I'm going to put just a few more touches of a darker tone in here. Just to strengthen a little bit that, that cloud feeling. 
Here I'm drying my, my paper. You can see it's lightened up. But one of the things I want to point out is you see me constantly, I rub my hand to, to feel the paper because it's really not thoroughly dry until it flattens out. If you have little, little bubbles and bumps as you go, it's not completely dry. I'm going to begin working up in the tree line and there's just a, a narrow grassy area that's right in front of the tree line that's still fairly green and I'm going to give the indication of that uh, little grassy area using a half inch flat brush and just some quick brush marks using uh, sap green. There's also some touches of, of a gold tone in that so I'm going to take some quinacrid and gold and uh, make a few brush marks with the quinacrid and gold and let it run right into the sap green. There's a, a, a darker tone at uh, the base of this uh, where the, this grass area meets the shoreline. So I'm just going to take a, a dark tone which is some of this green and gold with a little uh, ultramarine blue mixed in just a touch. And I just, just made a few marks with a half inch brush. Before I start painting the tree line and getting into some of these autumn colors, I'm going to show you an image of my palette here. This is typical when I'm mixing color in, in, during my painting process. It's, it's very fluid. Uh, I'll, I'll use a lot of water at times. And I generally, because I have my, my warm colors on the left, my cool colors on the right, I often mix that way with, I'll mix the warmer colors on the left well and the cooler colors in the right well. Not that they don't intermingle at times, but that's just the general approach that I have. The colors that I have on my palette right now are quinacrid and gold, which is in this lower corner, gamboge, which is right above it in the lower left corner on the warm side, Quinacrid and Coral, which is up top here. Sap Green, which is on the lower right. And Ultramarine Blue, which is in the top right. Those are the colors that are floating around on my palette uh, along with clear water. You can see by the mixtures uh, that these are all uh, fairly light to light middle value uh, washes that I have mixed here. There's nothing that I've mixed here that uh, is a dark value. If I were going to uh, mix a darker value mixture on my palette here, I would have less water, more pigment. Uh, so the pigment to water ratio would be different than what it is right now. I rarely, if ever, take paint directly from the well to paper. I always take it to my palette, mix it to the consistency I want, and then take it to my paper. Now, working with a palette that I just showed you, I'm going to begin uh, working on the, the distant tree line here. So I'm applying uh, just uh, water, and it does have a little bit of color in it, uh, really this could be just clear water, uh, but I've just given just a little bit of pigment in it uh, just to give an indication of where the wash is. Once I have this wash in, and I'm using a half inch flat brush here, this is another silver black velvet brush. I like that silver black velvet brush line in the larger wash brushes. I'm not as fond of the smaller sizes. So that first uh, light wash I had had just a touch of uh, quinacrid and gold in it, but now I'm coming back with a loaded brush. So my brush is fairly saturated with pigment from my palette, and I've got quinacrid and uh, gold with a little bit of quinacrid and coral in it, gives it the reddish tone, and I have some gamboge that I put in there to start. And now I'm just working across the page there with. Uh, my brush that's loaded again to the, to the really the point of saturation that the moment I touch it to this wet paper that paint discharges off the brush into the uh, the water that's floating on the paper and I my intent is to keep this 
uh, just a light middle value. I don't want my darkest values to be in that area. I want those to be in the foreground. I'll have lighter tones in the middle and I have some middle values towards the back and that'll help uh, reinforce the spatial relationship between the foreground, middle ground, and background. Here I'm taking a little bit of the mixture that's had some of the ultramarine blue added to it and just giving the indication of some some darker values under the trees. They're still by no means going to be the darkest values I have in the composition. I'm going to leave those for the foreground. But it does help uh, suggest that ground that's underneath the tree line. I've laid that wash in and I've let it dry just a little bit. It's not dry, but it's not uh, the shiny it doesn't have the shiny saturation to it. It's a, dried to a point where it's a damp paper and it has a sheen to it. And that's the, the best time to scrape. If it's too wet, the, the paint rushes just back, it rushes back in and actually creates a scar. When you get it to where it has just a sheen to the paper, you can normally take a, a plastic scraping tool or a cut up credit card or whatever you want to use to scrape with the end of a brush and uh, move that paint with the edge of it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm uh, doing some, some scratching with this plastic, but I'm moving the paint. I'm not actually scratching the paper. So I'm giving the indication of trees back here. And as I do this, I, I try to change directions a little bit. I try and change the width a little bit, even though they're all going to be pretty close. And I alter the spacing as well as the length of the marks I'm making. I want to have variation in what's going on back there. I don't want it to look like a picket fence and I don't have to try and indicate every tree. I'm just trying to give the suggestion of the pattern of trees that I saw in my photograph and in my reference and in my sketches and just give that indication of them. Here I'm taking uh, just a, a little bit uh, of a redder mixture from my palette and giving a little bit of an indication of some layering back here, some trees that are in front of some other trees back there, just shapes that I'm painting to give that indication. Next I'm going to start working on the reflections in the water. There's areas of the water that are going to pick up those fall colors and there's other areas that are going to uh, still reflect the color of the sky. So I'll be taking some of these uh, tones from the tree line and from the ground cover uh, that's in front of that tree line, that green strip, and given the suggestion of those reflections in the water. And there's going to be distinct breaks in uh, the areas that I'm painting in these fall tones. So you can see right now between these two shapes I've painted, you, you pick up the, the, the feeling that there's sky being reflected there. So when you look at a reflection in the water, there's, it's not, doesn't cover the whole surface of the water. It, it breaks up with the, the variation in, uh, in, the, in the water's surface. And some areas will pick up that distant tone from the woods, and other areas are going to reflect the sky. And when I began my painting, I painted the sky all the way down, knowing that I was going to be putting these reflections in. However, I know that these darker values would cover up and there'd be enough light reflecting back through that it wouldn't affect the, the brush marks that I would be making here. And now that those areas are wet with the tone I put down, I'm going to come back in with another uh, loaded brush, a small loaded brush that has some strong color in it, and just touch it to those uh, areas where I've just put that wash. And it's going to uh, give a, a soft uh, diffusion of that color within these shapes. So because it's, a, it's wet and wet that I'm working, so I'm going to have soft edges and I can just touch my brush to it and that color will start to diffuse. And I carry that tone from one shape to the next to give the feeling that that reflection is carrying along the top of the water. As I continue to paint here, I'm still working with the palette mixtures that you saw on my palette. I'm basically working with five colors. 
Conacred in gold, gamboge. Conacred in coral, sap green, and ultramarine blue. I'm adding another area here where I'm picking up these reflections. So I'm leading this wash across the page. And uh, I'm using conacrin and gold at the moment. I'm going to take the same approach that I did in the other uh, areas there. I'm going to uh, touch some of that color into these areas that are still very wet. So again, I'm working wet and wet, and I'm trying to carry some of those tones from one reflection, one area uh, to the next to give a suggestion of that, that uh, reflection just continuing on, but being broken up by, again, the variation in the surface of the water. Next, I'm going to take fine mist spray to the leading edge of all these reflections, and I'm going to just spray that downwards to soften the edge as it uh, diffuses into the blue tone that I laid down. So I, I, I've carried the, a fairly hard-edged approach to these reflections until I've gotten to the front leading edge of it where I'm just letting it somewhat dissipate into the, the, the reflection of the blue water. And here I've dried it and I'm coming back in uh, just to strengthen uh, a few areas. Next I'm going to take uh, some of this peacock blue that I used a little bit of earlier and I'm going to uh, give some variation to the surface of the, the blue in the water where it's reflecting the sky. So I'm trying to create the effect that uh, even though this entire area is blue, part of it is given uh, an, almost a, ref a mirror image of the clouds above and, and other uh, areas of this blue tone is more uh, the, the unevenness in the water and, and some of the, uh, the wave motion that happens. So it has a little bit of both. It's given a suggestion of the motion of the water at the same time the reflection of the clouds. So I've done quite a bit of that in, in the, the foreground area here. And now I'm going to take some of that same peacock blue tone and I'm going to go a little further back in my composition, just giving some touches of that tone to give the indication that the same thing is going on back there. Something else that I want to pick up in the reflection is the indication of uh, the, the trees that I scraped out of the, uh, the tree line back there. So to do that, I'm taking a damp brush and I'm going to do some lifting. I could have done some scraping while it was damp. However, it had been very tough to keep a clean edge into the blue. It would have drugged some of that pigment and left marks in the areas where I didn't want it. So I felt the best approach would be to come in once I've dried it completely and do some lifting here with the damp nylon brush. Before I move on and begin painting some of the tree shapes, I'm going to do another quick review of my palette. On the left, it is uh, pretty much what I had before. It's mixtures of quinacrid and gold, gamboge, and quinacrid and coral. And I've added just a little bit in the bottom right of that left mixing well some uh, raw sienna. And on the right side, I've mixed some more neutral earthy tones to, to paint the trees. And I have raw sienna, uh, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, and a little bit of rose matter quinacridone. So I have some blue mixtures, some... Uh, kind of earthy tones that are a mixture of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and some cerulean blue and raw sienna that give me some nice earthy tones. I'm going to begin painting these trees with a half inch flat brush. I'm using a mixture of cerulean blue and raw sienna. 
and I'm just going to bring this wash down this tree and at first I'm starting to use uh, a uh, low moisture brush and creating a broken edge but I've decided I'm going to just bring this down uh, as a wash and here you can see that I've got a little bit of the cooler tone in there also so I take that mixture between raw sienna and the cerulean blue and uh, some of the mixture has a little bit more of a blue tone to it and some of it leans more towards the warm with the raw sienna. But I'm going to put a wash on this and I'm going to bring it down. And then towards the bottom there, don't forget that I have some of this masking fluid. I have it around the lower half of my composition primarily, but some of those areas will be highlighted when I remove that masking fluid. Here I'm bringing in a little bit of a darker cool tone uh, on that shadow side and I'm working wet on wet. I'm going to carry that over to this other tree shape. So I'm just bringing that wash down and I'm going to start adding some of the branches as I do that. So they come together as one shape and they don't feel like uh, each uh, branch is a separate piece from this tree. And if I, Because if I'm not careful and I don't bring that together uh, as one wash, you'll start getting hard lines where I don't want them. Um, but uh, so I'm trying to keep it moist as I add color and, and uh, bring the, these uh, the, the limbs of the tree and the trunks all together to kind of form one shape. And that, that very warm tone I brought in is uh, just pretty much raw sienna. I switched to a rigger brush. This is a number six rigger that I have and uh, it's also called a liner brush depending on the manufacturer how they uh, identify it but uh, I've loaded it up with a darker mixture here of the ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna and I'm just painting in the indication of these branches Here I'm taking that same brush and I'm giving an indication of some of these um, briars and weeds and, and things that are growing up from the ground here on the shoreline. Uh, I'm using the same mixture there with the burnt sienna and the ultramarine blue. I want to get a darker tone on these trees so I'm coming back with a darker mixture here that has more of the ultramarine blue in it and a uh, heavier concentration of pigment. And I'm using a combination of uh, darker valued warm and cool. But there's still kind of a middle dark value or a dark middle value. There's still not some of the darkest dark values that I'm gonna eventually have in my uh, composition. still working with the same flat brush and I've loaded it up with some of the uh, fall colors that I've been using. This mixture here is the quinacridin gold with uh, a lot of quinacridin coral mixed in and a little bit of burnt sienna. And I'm just taking my brush and given the suggestion of these uh, fall colors laying on the ground I'm going to work in some of this quinacridin gold and a little gamboge and I'm trying to make my brush strokes express the direction and and the contour of the land as I uh, as I make these brush strokes and then some of them I'll try and make it so they, they feel like they're on the, the this plant or, or uh, brush that's going up more vertical in the air but uh, as, I, as I make my brush marks I'm aware of the contour that I'm trying to describe uh, in the composition. As I continue, you can see that I brought some more of a green tone into the painting. Uh, that's uh, the sap green mixed in with uh, some of these other colors that I've been using here. Some of the quinacridin gold and a little bit of the quinacridin coral and it makes more of an earthy green 
uh, and some areas I'm using some pure sap green also. Now I've gotten the majority of this foreground covered with a tone and you'll notice in the left hand side there there's some areas of uh, larger areas of white that I've left uh, uh, the pure white of the paper and I'm going to come in there with some uh, uh, some quinacrin and gold or some gamboge but a gold tone a little bit later to give the suggestion of some larger uh, gold toned uh, leafy shapes now I'm going to take my scraping tool and I'm just going to make some marks here that suggest some lighter valued um, linear marks to give a suggestion of plant life here laying at the base of this tree and just as I did up top I waited for the paper to get to a condition where the paint had a bit of a sheen to it but it wasn't completely dry and it's not saturated so it's at a good point where I can move the pigment and I'm going to make some marks here on the ground that just suggest that there's some sticks or some twigs laying horizontally too so um, just trying to create interesting patterns and textures and shapes so I'll have an element of splatter when I remove the masking tool or masking fluid and I have some linear marks here that I'm making with my uh, scraping tool I'll be making additional linear marks and uh, other marks with my brushes of course Well, I still have the opportunity and can move paint. I'm going to take a, a wider edge of my scraping tool. I'm going to make some marks that contour the land. This area here in the foreground is an area of underbrush and rocks and twigs and fallen leaves. It's not a tranquil area. It's a very chaotic arrangement here that I'm trying to interpret and suggest to the viewer. So that's my approach. Is almost a chaotic approach here to give that suggestion of what's going on here on the on the edge of this lake. I want to build up my values a little bit more. It's not uh, unusual for me as my painting evolves to come back a number of times and go darker with my values. As I apply my paint and dry my paper, uh, it's a gradual uh, step from the from the lighter areas of the value range to the darker. I don't go to my darkest darks all at once. I gradually build them up. And here I want to give the indication of some of these shadowed areas that are hitting the smaller tree. Here I'm going to place one of the reference photos in the upper right hand corner and you can see how this is developing. And some of the colors I've made brighter. This is the, the reference photo without the, the tree line. Uh, it shows more of the base of the tree. And that's the area I'm working in. You can see I'm building up the shadows on this smaller tree. And I've tried to suggest uh, the kind of chaos that's going on on the ground uh, with the various techniques I've used to apply the watercolor. Now I'm coming in with some of my darkest values, still working with a half inch flat brush and I have a dark mixture here that has, uh, I've brought in some royal blue and some burnt sienna and I've even added a little bit of a lizard and crimson to the mixture that, that uh, uh, royal blue and lizard and crimson makes a, a very deep purple tone. And you can see I'm just rotating my brush I'm not being real specific with it I'm just trying to again uh, represent some of the chaos there on the ground and uh, I'll use the corner of my brush and the edge of my brush and the tip of the brush just to to make a variety of uh, brush marks I'm taking some of these a very dark valued uh, brush marks and take and, and putting them up on this tree. So now you can see some of the light lights that I have in the uh, middle ground there with the reflection in the water and now as you get to the foreground I, I start to get some of my darkest values and this starts to create spatial relationships between what's going on in the foreground and the middle ground and the background so I'm having 
uh, the majority of my darkest values are going to be in the foreground and uh, a lot of my lighter tones are in the middle ground and then I have middle values in the background in the distant tree line. Again, I'm coming in with some of the dark values here and I, I still try to contour the ground, create a little bit of direction as I make my brush uh, marks. To the right, I have some saplings that I have drawn that are coming up from the shore here. And I've actually put some masking fluid there at the beginning there when I use a masking fluid pen. And now I'm taking this uh, rigger brush and I'm just putting a dark value along the edge of some of those marks. And when I remove the masking fluid, I'll have the combination of the dark values and the lighter values working together to describe these saplings. And I'm also making some uh, some more just kind of vertical and uh, some of them are a little curved but some of these linear marks that further give the the, the, the uh, suggestion of some of this uh, twigs and, and branches that are sticking up off the ground. These saplings have some small leaves that are hanging on them. So to give that suggestion, I'm going to put some tissue down to protect some of the areas of the painting. And I'm just going to take a brush loaded with a darker value here. And I'm just going to lightly tap it on my hand to create a splatter. And I'll try and change the, the direction that I'm pointing that brush as I tap it. So it, it gives a variety of uh, direction the way those marks fall. If I, just, if I don't turn the brush at all, it'll start to make make the splatter feel very directional and linear almost in the way they're they're streaming down so I try and rotate that around so they go in every direction. And I'm also going to take a little bit of green a little bit of orange in there too and now I'm going to take my tissues and I'm going to move them and I'm going to do a little bit of the same type of splatter along the uh, uh, edge of the ground here. So this just gives the suggestion of little leaves and berries, dried out berries and things that hang on to some of these uh, branches as the seasons change. I've completely dried my paper and now I'm going to take a rubber cement pickup eraser and I'm going to begin removing the dried masking fluid which will reveal the white of the paper below. And one of the things I'll say is um, when you're doing this and you're removing your masking fluid, when you get close to an edge, uh, be aware of the direction you're pulling because if you pull your eraser into the tape, uh, which is what I about did there, you're, you're going to start to lift your tape off. So when you get close to the edge, it's good if you can uh, just come at an angle that's coming from the outside in like I am right there so you won't pull your tape up. And as I get most of this off I'll rub my hand across the paper so that I can feel any that's left on the paper and there normally is some there that uh, you just come back and just keep rubbing until you can't find any more. Now that I've removed the masking fluid and revealed some of these larger areas, I'm going to come in with a gold tone here and give the suggestion of some leaves laying on the ground, some leafy shapes, and some piles of leaves. To me, this is an effective technique for accomplishing this. You could paint around these shapes, um, but uh, when I'm creating an area, working in an area that's so large and has so much texture and so much chaos going on, I just find it's an effective method using the masking fluid to accomplish this result rather than trying to paint around it because I can become much freer with the uh, the washes, the initial washes that I'm putting down and then I can come back to this area that I preserved and just put a nice clean wash in the, in the shape that is revealed when I remove that masking fluid. There I'm putting a little bit of a green tone uh, in some of those areas also. And I'm going to take my brush with some of the gold tone and the green and just 
give more indication of some of these leafy shapes hanging on these uh, branches and thicket. Here I'm making some more uh, marks here to indicate these leaf shapes using a green tone. So when you look here, I've got a few layers of texture that I've created. I have the uh, original splatter that I did with the masking fluid. Then I came back and I splattered some darker value paint. And I've come in with some green and gold brush marks to give more of an indication of the leafy shapes. And all these uh, are of different values and different sizes and shapes. Now I have a smaller liner brush loaded with a dark value and I'm uh, making some more linear marks here to suggest some of these branches and uh, briars here along the shoreline. And I'm making some marks too that give uh, more of an indication of some of these leaf shapes but very dark valued leaf shapes almost shadowed. So I've, again I continue to build the layers of texture that I have here and the layers of linear marks. So I have dark over light, light over dark, and I just continue to build uh, those layers as I develop my painting. I want to strengthen the indication here of these saplings coming out off the shore. So I'm taking this darker value with this smaller liner brush to uh, strengthen those linear shapes. I'm going to do the same with the second sapling. Originally I had given the indication of both these using my masking fluid pen and then I had put some darker value along the edge of it and I removed it and it didn't make a strong enough statement to give that the uh, feeling that those saplings were there. So now I've come back with my liner brush and I've strengthened that suggestion of those saplings. And here I'm giving the indication again of some more leaf shapes. Here I'm doing some more liner brush work, adding a little bit more to uh, what's going on in the branches of the trees. Just more suggestions of branches and twigs. And as I do this, I want to try and make it look as though some of these are moving behind or over top of the, the larger branches or the trunks of the trees themselves. With that kind of uh, overlap and continu continuing the, the shapes beyond, uh, behind, uh, say, a tree trunk and coming out the other side just helps make it more believable uh, from a, a depth perspective. Um, it helps add dimension to what's going on in the composition. So far, most of the linear marks have been right along the edge of the bank. But there's also some of the, the weeds and some of the saplings uh, just coming out uh, all across the, the ground there. So I'm bringing some of those marks uh, more towards the front of the foreground here. And once again, I've decided I want to get a little darker here uh, with the value on the, these tree shapes. So I've got a, a jumbo round small wash brush that I use that I've loaded up with uh, a fairly fluid uh, dark valued mixture from my palette. And this is the ultramarine blue with burnt sienna, actually some royal blue in there, and even a touch of alizarin crimson. I'm pretty much done, but I've decided that I wanted to get a little bit more of a, a red fall color into the painting here. I feel I have a little too much of, a, of an even orange tone here, even though there's some gold. I'd like to go a little bit redder in some areas. Not everywhere, but just giving some indications here with some quinacridone and coral on top of what I've already done. And then I'm softening the application there a little bit with this fine mist spray. But you can see now how I've just brought a little bit more 
of a, of a red fall color into this. And I'm going to touch that in a few places here in my composition. I'm bringing a little bit of that uh, red tone to the left of my uh, composition here on the left side. And again, softening the application with a fine mist spray. I'm going to fill that, that shape there a little bit. And I think I'm going to take some more of that red tone into the, the, the reflection that's uh, further down in the composition here. So I'm just making some marks of that tone. And then I just hit it with that spray bottle to diffuse that color and soften that application up. So I just bring that color down in the reflection. And I think I want to have uh, some of that red tone more in the foreground also. I don't want it just to be isolated uh, in the top half of my painting. So I'm taking the same quinacridone and coral mixture, putting some touches of that color in the foreground, and again I'm softening it with a fine mist spray. And there you have my painting Fall Lake. And you can see the photograph in the right hand corner and see how I've interpreted this subject matter. And we're going to wrap this video up by putting a white mat on the painting to get rid of the masking tape and the board around it just to get a good look. And that's the painting Fall Lake. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to check out my Facebook group, Brick Sorowitz Watercolor Friends and Subscribers. And as always, if you have questions about my materials, you can always go to the studio page on my website, rsorowitzart.com. And you can email me at contactrsorowitzart at gmail.com if you have questions. Thanks for watching.